Yeah, the reason I was asked to be with a bunch of architects for a bunch of years was because I represent architecture in my work. And, and to a large extent, you become what you represent. I mean, media, uh, celebrity, the whole thing, everything is like that. So um, that's a kind of an interesting thing, because I'm not an architect. I never studied architecture, and yet I'm very much interested in, in um, the relationship between uh, space and experience and memory. Um, my work, I st I, just background. When I give a talk, I, you will see that I talk with my eyes closed. And, um, and it is really a matter of concentration. My daughter uh, has, has, was very upset once. I gave at Middlebury College, I did a big mural for the center of the college. And I gave a speech there. And, and after the speech, uh, the talk of about two hours, my daughter runs up to me and says, please look at the audience and, close, and don't close your eyes. But it's a matter of concentration. So you'll see me looking at the ceiling when I'm talking to you, or I close my eyes, and it's just a matter of me trying to keep everything straight. Both my parents, uh, my father was a, was a painter. He's been dead for 15, 20 years. And my mother's an artist. At the age of 97, she's had her first show. And she's getting a lot of play. People are buying her work, which is really great. I grew up in the art world. I went to California Institute of the Arts. I grew up in Santa Monica, California. As a child, I lived in Rome, very important time for me when I was eight years old. And I also lived in uh, Venezuela when I was five and in Chile when I was 16. So, uh, and then ever since 1981, I've been traveling. I went to CalArts. I studied under John Baldessari, um, fantastic uh, school and a fantastic person. Uh, quite a few of my friends um, moved to New York. I was the first one from my class to move to New York. And uh, I got out of L.A. very, very quickly. And um, this work that I'm going to be showing, talking about, started in 1972. So we're going on, I don't know, 45 years uh, since I started doing what I'm doing. And I'm still doing it. I'm trying still to, uh, to uncover things and to figure it all out. This is, it will continue. This will continue. In 19, so now that's, that's that. The, the lectures are in three parts. The first part is going to be me doing drawings. Uh, the second part is, uh, so you see me try and figure it out. Uh, these lectures have evolved over years and have in a way become an art form for myself. They help me to define what I do to others. They do what the art does. It's like a performance. So when people talk about or ask about these things, it's kind of a hybrid be between a performance uh, and a lecture. It's kind of both. Um, basically because uh, the lecture represents the performance and the performance rep represents the work. And so it's kind of all bound up like this. Three parts. The first part is the blackboard where I don't have any, you just see me try and it comes out of my head. The second part is slides where you get to see what I was talking about at this part. And the third part is a video if we have time of me doing a performance at, uh, in a trance state. Um, okay. In 1972, I was very much involved with light. Um, I was, I, what I would do is I was interested in emanating light and reflected light. Um, since I grew up with TV, um, my generation grew up with TV, the pictures generation as they call it now, um, TV was very important. And so my issues with light would be, um, for instance, a piece called Reflected Black, where it was just a, be a, a black uh, piece of plexiglass. Um, and then I had Projected Black, which was a black slide. Uh, obviously, no light is being shown on the screen, or if any, very minimal amount. You don't see it. 
um, I had colors where I put color aid cards for painting. So all these colors were simply put on a wall and then I uh, put all the lights in the room were green. So all the colors had been changed. I did a piece where I laid out, I, it was a performance evening at, at CalArts, and I turned out the lights in the auditorium and covered the floor with color and uh, color aid cards and then picked it all best I could, picked it all up and put it back in the box and then turned the lights back on again. And I was interested in the, the quality of the color in the room at that time. And the, the fact is, is that there was color and there was no color because color is light. So if you go halfway, then it's negated, but then still it still exists. And so this whole issue of, uh, of light and this negation of what I see. So it really comes down to what I see. So what I said was, all I see are light patterns. When I look at you, what my eye sees is simply light patterns. I don't see people. Well, I see people, but that's a second generation. First generation is light pattern. And um, if I say that you are only light that my eye sees, then if I look at you or if I look at the computer, there's no difference. Living and, living and dying, death, objects, there's no difference. It's simply light. That's all it is. There's nothing else. And my, my work was really all about that. Then I was Easter 73. Uh, we were driving back. We went on a kind of a holiday from, from Cal Arts, which was in the middle of nowhere, kind of like this place, far, far away. And we all drove off to the beach and, and maybe Santa Barbara, Malibu. And coming back over the hills, I had an idea for a, 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 an idea. I had an idea. And the idea was... The detail of a car's tire. And it's a car that never existed, um, never was built, and yet the tire exists. And there is an implication of the rest of the car which we don't see. And I can ask questions such as, where is the car going? Where has the car been? Who's driving the car? Um, what's the color of the car? Is there anything in the back seat of the car? Is there, uh, is there a passenger? Is it a Cadillac? Is it an Oldsmobile? Is it a BMW? Is it a Mercedes? Um, how fast is the car going? Um, the road it's on, is it a dirt road? Is it a paved road? So I'm asking questions about what is happening beyond the frame. And uh, so in a way, I'm going into this place that does not exist and then making a left turn or a right turn out beyond it and seeing where it goes and what it is. So that's really what um, I was up to was just about getting the, 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 the going into the picture, you could say. At the time that I had this idea, I was dealing with reflected light and all this other stuff. But when you have this issue of light, it's an, it's an algorithm. It's a, what, what the constant is because light changes from moment to moment. So this red cap, if I put it here, it's one, it looks one way. If I put it down here, it's another, and it moves continuously as I move. What is remaining is the algorithm uh, between the light and the color, and that is a constant. So then you go from here to, 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 to this, is there's, there's a kind of an algorithm that I've set up here and that we're falling into. So at this time, um, I can say that if all I see are light patterns, where is life in those patterns? Where does life exist in the pattern? And that's what this is about. So at this point, I did a, uh, I invented a stick figure. And he was in a room, and I had a clock and a calendar. 
and I had a plant and I called him Glenn. And um, the thing that Glenn did that I was interested in, one of the things he did, so this is, um, uh, I was in a class, my class that I was with in John Baldessari uh, was called Post Studio Art. That means, that was the name of the class. And this was in a way my studio, this, this drawing here. And uh, you could say that he was a bit of an alter ego. I named him in order to give him some kind of personality and a presence, like Donald Duck or Bugs Bunny. And, um, and he did all kinds of things. In the end, I made about a thousand drawings of, of stick figures doing various things. I went through their, their, their psyche and their physical body, their intentions, and I had very small stories, like Glenn remembering the time he heard himself skiing or Glenn trying to surprise me, or Glenn, you know, doing whatever. And here what he's doing, and he has a pin, and he's pricking his finger. Or he has a knife, and he's cutting his arm. And when he's doing this, uh, I'm interested in the pain that Glenn feels inside that place. Uh, pain existing in the picture itself. So it's a matter of going in again. So um, he was doing, and, and, and so if when he does feel pain, where is that pain? Because I can feel it. So then, one of the earliest pictures, this was still in 73, I, I, um, I was kind of inventing a, a life here, and then what I also did was to um, put death in the picture. So I have a dead man in there, a cadaver is in there with Glenn. So you have a living person and a dead person. So I was interested in the life that he had led. His, he's still living and he's dead. Remember I talked about how uh, in, in, if all I see are light patterns, there's no difference between living things and dead things, except for movement and probably, uh, yeah, movement. Um, that, would be, that would be something here. Um, at this time, I wanted to, this just illustrates what I was doing. At this time, I wanted to um, do a drawing, a real drawing of a cadaver, a dead man. And I called up the city morgue in New York and asked if I could go down there and take a photo. I even wrote down in my notebook my fantasies about what they would tell me. Because I was terrified to call up the morgue. And so... What in the end they told me was that um, I couldn't do it. They didn't even talk to me. They just said, you know, privacy, we cannot allow you in here. And so that was done. A friend of mine was going to medical school at, in Yale University and had a cadaver, a dead person that he was working on for, for uh, uh, months. And the cadaver's head was wrapped in formaldehyde. And um, I was interested in the head, and he had understood this. So he said, look, we just unwrapped the head yesterday. We're already dissecting the back of the head, and if you want to come up here, you're welcome. So I quickly got on the next train and went up there, and um, there was the cadaver. I went into the room, and there were all the bodies, one after the other. And he was on his stomach. And um, as uh, we went up to his the cadaver, his cadaver was male, and we turned him over because he was on his stomach because they had to start the back at the back of the head. And, and as we turn the cadaver over, his left arm falls off, falls onto the floor. So then I truly picked up the arm and put it back next to him because they'd already dissected through the joint. And what I, and then with the cadaver, I did what Glenn does to himself. So if Glenn pinched his arm, I pinched the cadaver's arm. So I pinched the cadaver's arm, I put my hands over the cadaver's face, I slapped the cadaver's arm, I put, I put my hands into the cadaver's guts. What really I was doing was doing to the cadaver what we would do to ourselves to, sh to kind of demonstrate that we were alive. And um, so, like, the, like putting, shouting in the cadaver's ear, uh, putting my hands underneath his nose so he can see if he smells 
um, this is what I was doing. The next day, we were talking about this, and it was interesting. We said he looked uh, sad. He looked poor. He looked like he was a street person that had sold his body uh, to for, for 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 money, for drugs, or for alcohol. It smelled. It it was crusty. It was squishy. It was so this himness and itness was back and forth, back and forth. Now the issue of saying, "Are you human or not?" Are you is is really at the forefront of this issue of subject-object split, which what you learn in art class. There's the marble, and then there's the, the which is the form. I mean the material, and then you have the image, uh, the man that is represented in the marble. And there's always this back and forth. Um, with the cadaver, it's mo it's right there. I mean that is the highest level of this problem of the content context problem and um, so this was something that was really interesting to me that just in my memory of us talking the next day this is what 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 was going on that I was back and forth between this at the same time as I was doing this stuff with the cadaver I was cutting up comic books I was interested in the air that existed in the picture so if Superman is flying in the sky of a comic book, I was interested in, in, the, in the weather. I was interested in the air that he was flying through, the sun that was above him, and the trees that were below him. And I cut out details. So you'd have the, um, say for instance, assorted foods, or there's no light, or there's gravity, or there's water, or there's, there's sound, or there's whatever. So I was dissecting these details from these comics and making uh, collages, just a single detail on a sheet of paper, and have a field of these papers with different phenomenon as they exist, because I wanted to go into the picture, as I did with the, with the, with the, with the, with the, with the wheel. Um, I wanted to prove now I grew up. Uh, I grew up in 19 in the late 60s and early 70s. That's when I was a young person, and uh, I was born in 51. So say in 70 I was 20 years old. So I was like 22 or 23 when I was doing all this stuff. And the thing was is that we followed minimal art. I follow minimal art. I follow conceptual art. At the time when I was at school. Uh, the most important artists were the conceptual artists. Joseph Kosuth, Lawrence Wiener, Robert Berry, Hannah Darboven. Um, these were the information people. They had reduced, the, you were at the very end of reductivism, minimalism, where things have become less and less and less. So what has happening is that with the surrealists and the symbolists, the, the, the image was very important and that had all been transferred into the object. The object was where you had someone like Carl Andre where he put plates on the floor and you're walking on the plates that there's no metaphor. There is no uh, symbolic anything. It's just material. They're trying to get rid of the projection. Trying to get rid of it. So I come along and our generation comes along. What are we going to do? How, what's next? What are you going to do after that? And um, I suppose I wanted to prove that stick figures live lives. I wanted to get into the picture and explore it. Um, and so that's what I was doing. That's what I was following, all of that. So I would say that it's imp an impossibility to simply walk on a floor uh, like a Carl Andre and look at it as if, and just see the material. There are associations that we, our brains are amazing, and they project everything everywhere all the time. They never stop. They never stop. You never stop thinking, ever. Uh, it's a machine. And maybe the minimalists were making great efforts to jump out of that machine, but I, I be believe that it was an impossibility. I was interested in my dreams at this point, uh, remembering details from my dreams. So the sun in my dreams, the smells in my dreams, 
the, the, the sounds in my dreams, uh, just notating them in the morning. I remember having an argument with my father in a dream, and we're inside a small house, a small, not even a house, it's a room, and he's there, and I'm here, and we're talking about where we are in a dream. He says, this is a dream, it's not real, and I say, it's a dream and it's real. I can feel the floor when I, when I stamp on it, and he says, but it's just, it's all fake, it's not real, and I remember um, saying, it's real, it's real, it's real. And as I did that, the, um, the floor was moving. So obviously there was space under the floor and there was a part of that environment which I could not see that was made evident by doing that. So at this time, my, my dream life was very exceptional. This is the fall of 73. Um, and I was doing all these drawings, uh, rapidograph drawings of this imaginary place and at the same time as I was doing that, I was taking photographs of where I was living. Um, I lived on the Upper East Side. I was taking care of an apartment for a, some collectors of my father's. And I, was, I took photographs of my bedroom, my bed, my clothes, my shoes, my, the kitchen, the cups and the cabinet, the refrigerator with the food I had bought. I was, I was taking photographs of everything around me. Um, and I had a, it was as if I was marking my reality while cutting up other ones. So there I was in the midst of doing all of this uh, stuff going into, into this kind of imaginary universe, you could say, this, these details. And so at the same time, this room that I had created, I had, for instance, because it was kind of like a meta studio space, and um, and then I had a drawing of, of 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 something that never existed, a fictional object, and then I had a draw a, a, on that table is a drawing of something from a dream and then I had a drawing of something in front of me which is a magnifying glass and then I had a drawing of an object uh, from what I thought would be a cosmology and so these all of these realities could exist in this reality so this reality could hold these other ones um, so this was something that never existed this was a very, my first nightmare. I was cr crawling in the Alps or in the mountainside, pulling a giant telephone the size of this room. And uh, there was a dragon that was chasing me as I was pulling this phone through the Alps. And this is the phone. There was a magnifying glass. And this was when I was trying to figure out what to make. And this is a part of my work which I get in trouble for. And I still get in trouble for this part of the work. And in a way, it's kept me young because I get in such trouble for it. And I was debating if I should talk about this uh, here because it seems to be, I don't know how important it would be for you all, but it's um, a cosmology. Uh, I grew, both my parents uh, collected art from around the world. Um, so we, and, and I was filled, the walls, like, like in the 40s or in the 30s, an artist collected stuff like this. So we had a lot of Navajo objects and objects from, uh, we had a lot of objects from uh, the New Guinea, Azmat Shield and things like this. We had objects from Central America. We had objects, Egyptian objects my mother had, uh, Chinese, Japanese, from around the world. Uh, all these things. And I was sitting in the living room looking at all these like a, there was a, a Brazilian feather basque on the wall. And, um, and then there was a, a Hopi uh, war god. Very, very powerful, dangerous thing. And um, none of it was considered art when it was made. Art didn't really exist in those cultures. And yet, what were they doing? They were making medicine. Uh, most of these things were medicinal. And they had to do with somehow trying to control the future. 
they represented a kind of cosmology, an animist type of cosmology. And so I thought, well, that seems to be really important for an artist to do this. Art is really based in this kind of thing. So I, and as a child, I remembered that when I was very young, I thought I would see photographs of my parents that before I was born, when I, when I was six or seven years old, I believed that before I was born, I was on a conveyor belt. I never went to church as a child, very, very rarely, only when I was in Chickasha, Oklahoma, visiting with my, my father, or living in Venezuela when I was with my mother. They, 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 they never were separated, but at one point I was there in Venezuela with my mom. And I would see photographs of my parents in the 40s because they were quite a couple and there were lots of photographs of them with other artists. And I asked, where was I? And they said, you were not born yet. And I still continued to ask, so where was I? If I wasn't born, where was I? So then I came up with a, I answered this question. I was, I was on a conveyor belt. And on this conveyor belt, it had different names. And I chose Mulliken. And I went down the chute of Mulliken and I was born. So this is choosing my parents, choosing my life. So it answers the question, where was I before I was born? And then I believed also as a child in fate. And fate had a TV that he looked at and on the TV was, a fo was an image of me. And he sees me on TV, and then he has this lever that he pulls, 1951, and then 2000, whatever, okay? <laughs> the early drawings of this, you'll see, 2030, maybe, or 2015, or 2000, no, obviously 15 is not working, so, but 2000, maybe 25, but, it, okay, 25, we'll do 25. And, um, and he, sees me and he's pulling this great lever and that's what this is this is just the lever and i put it into this so this is a bit of a deity of sorts so he's looking at me controlling so this answers the question of why do things happen the way they do while i live my life why did the dog bite me why did i miss my what, what happened yesterday when i was trying to get here and there were no flights between dusseldorf and geneva well then you could say well it's you know fate's issue you're not fated to be here last night. There was, no reason, there was a reason for you to be here today and not yesterday. And that's what this guy does. And um, so then, uh, so I had this beginning of a cosmology. Then, since I was involved with death uh, so much, I said, well, okay, since I'm involved with death, what we can do, and this is something that I invented at the time. So this is like 73, where fate comes down into this semicircular corridor and meets with death. And they talk to each other. And they talk in numbers. And they decide if I should go up to heaven or if I should go down to hell. And so this then answers the question of where, um, where, what happens after I die? So the cosmology uh, answers the question of where, what happens before I'm born, why do things happen the way they do, and what happens after I die? It contextualizes my life. And this is a model of a cosmology that I don't believe in, and yet I have been working on it for 45 years, and, or 43 years, 
and, and it continues to evolve. It continues to change, and it is the most problematic part of my work. Um, when I went to CalArts, you could do anything. I mean, anything but this. This you couldn't do. You couldn't do anything spiritual. This was out of question. You can't do this. There was a guest artist who came who was collecting semen from famous artists that were teaching at the school and putting it in little jars and then going into the wall and putting the semen and mixing it with the cement and putting it into the walls. And this was absolutely fine. This is no problem. But for me to talk about heaven, this was a problem. I, I have made models of different chapters of this. The thing has evolved. In 1981, it went through a major change. You'll see it in the slides. And um, I've had a dealer uh, wanting to work with me, a super important dealer, a German dealer. And he says that he would love to represent me, but he will not represent that. He would not represent the cosmology. It's, it, it, he didn't want to be involved with that at all. And yet, and, and I'm doing a lecture, I had a show at the Lantos Museum in Linz, and there was a room with the models for the cosmology. And uh, Peter Kogler had brought his class in, and he noticed that they all backed away. They all kind of went like this when I was talking. And he said, you're a conceptual artist, right? Yes. You don't believe in this, correct? It's, it's, it's a proposition to be talked about, yes. And, but I had lost the students. The students were f a bit freaked out. And yet, this is the part, this is the oldest part of what I do. It used to be that this was all there was. Just go back 200 years. And the majority of artwork had to do with the representation of, the, of, of religious uh, themes. I mean, go back again and again and again. It was like you had to do it. And now, so once that's all gone, what are we replacing it with? Um, we're replacing it with other things now. Now, in today's world, now, you know, design and, and celebrity and, you know, Warhol and so forth and so on is very, very important. And I'm very much interested in the difference between uh, design and art uh, because there's just a different motive. So here I have this cosmology all set up. And um, at the same time as I was uh, doing this, I was... Um, demonstrating this idea of entering the picture. I did a performance where I sat in a chair and there was a man in front of me and he had a Paranese print, which was a, a, just out of a cut out of a regular book. And, and he was sit, sitting there with it and I projected my mind's eye into the print and walked around in it. Um, immediately when I walked into the print, I was uh, 11 years old and it was, I think, uh, uh, around noon when I walked in. It had rained the night before, and it, everything was very wet. And I was walking to, the, um, walking to the arch that was being uncovered, the Paranese arch. And I walked underneath the arch, walked around the arch, and then I went off the picture up above and looked down at the arch and saw great puddles in the top of the arch uh, from above. And at that point, he took out a match and lit the picture up and there was nothing left. I remember feeling the heat and I thought this would be fun, like in Twilight Zone or something. I'd be stuck there forever since I got rid of the portal, was gone, I would be done, I would be toasted. But that's not what happened. I looked down at my feet, I saw my feet, I saw the place, and I skied down the hill, um, just kind of like playing as I went down the hill, ran around, hugged my dad, and then ran home. And that was the end of the performance. And people after the performance uh, came up to me and asked and had ideas about where I was. But I was really much involved with the physicality, the weather, the, the sense of the air, the sense of things in that space. This is probably the first time that I went into a trance state in relationship to my work. When I talked, I I've been, did interviews with my hip, some of my hypnotists, they said, this is what you were doing. You were going in. Also, entering the picture, it then becomes something later on when you have virtual reality. Um, that's what I was trying to do. I'm trying to 
enter the picture. As I said, prove that stick figures live lives. So here I am with the cosmology, which is one thing. And then I had, um, at this point, I had a series of, I had photographs. I was making photographs. So here's a photo of a man. And it could be a photo of uh, Glenn Ford. But I'll call him Glenn. And then I have a cartoon of a person. So that's a cartoon. And I'll call him Glenn. And then I have a line drawing of um, Glenn. And then I have a, uh, a stick figure, you know, like my Glenn. Framed. Okay, these are all framed. And then a stick figure unframed, just drawn on the wall. And then I have a sign from a bathroom of a man. We'll make him black. And then I have that man broken up. And then I have a head and body, which seem to be the most minimal representation of a human form I could come up with head and body. And then I had a circle square triangle. So what's going on, and this is all framed, and this is unframed. So I did a piece, for instance, a head and body. There's a, a famous piece by Mel Bachner, who was a conceptual artist. And it was called leveling, which is a lot of a long post, and then he stuffed a lot of stuff underneath it to make it five degrees off the ground. And I said to myself, "What if I put a pillow underneath that uh, that piece of wood, and, and then it would become figurative? Then it would become this was like in the mid '70s." And so I have a thing called a piece called Sleeping Child, which is simply a piece of wood resting on a pillow. Now, the thing about that is even the cadaver, the fucking cadaver, had a pillow. There's a piece of wood behind the head. There are none of them are without a pillow. They all have pillows, these cadavers. And to what purpose is that pillow there? I mean, there's no reason except that they have to be more comfortable somehow. Um, so we cannot help it. We project and we, and we do this continuously. So um, that's this point here. Um, the, so if I, if I say that uh, his name is Glenn and I say he's, he's 35 years old, uh, you'd say yes. If a cartoon figure, 35 years old and his name is Glenn. But if I go to here and say he's 35 years old and has Glenn, it becomes funny. If I go to here and say his name is 30, his name is Glenn and is 35 year old, or if I go to the symbol because symbols represent all men and no singular man, um, and I say, but I say he's an individual, he has a name and he has a place where he lives, you're becoming the further this direction you go, the crazier you are. So I have the head and the body. And they're breaking up around here. Now, if um, I was to take, and what I would do with my early lectures, I'd lay out these photographs on the floor, and then I would get a pin, a la voodoo, or, and I would prick the photograph. I would prick the, this, the cartoon. I would prick the line drawing. I would prick the stick figure, framed and unframed. I would prick the head and body, and I would prick the, uh, the circle square triangle, and I'd say, who feels the most pain? Who feels the pin the most? And they almost always said, around here, felt the most pain. This is too remote into this other world. They're living another life, and this is too abstract. But here is kind of a sweet spot of, of that transference, that we can say that that's where they feel the most pain. Now it's very different that if you have a, a picture being pricked, 
than if they prick themselves. So if he, if they, if this person is, is getting a knife and pulling the knife down his arm uh, about an, an, a, 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 a centimeter as he goes down and there's blood flowing from the arm um, and doing it as a photo, it's much more uh, problematic than if a stick figure is doing it or if a head and body is doing it. Um, and first of all, a head and body cannot do it, but uh, a gland here can. And if you want to keep going, you go up to here and it's film. Film or video. And then you have theater. And then you have the world frame. And then you have the world. And then you have the elements, which are the same as this. So it's a circular thing that goes around, that, that you could see, that, that goes around. So if I was to have a film of someone doing that, or if it were in the theater, someone gets a knife and does this, and then or here, where someone actually does it in front of you, that is the worst. If someone does it, if you are standing, if I'm in a room and I just take out a knife and I start, you freak out. Um, if it was a film of it, it would be a different thing. So that would be here. So if, if, if they hurt themselves, it's much more dynamic. This thing called mirror neurons or whatever would be over here. Now this was, this chart was, I came up with in the mid 70s and I'm still interested in it. My most recent work has to do uh, again with the internet, but pictures, I have of these pictures of public executions, which are horrible, horrible things. And I show, and then people can't look at them. Um, they're so terrible. Uh, and so I'm really interested in the fact that someone cannot look at them. I'm interested in sex as it pertains to the internet. So, and also in daily life, and that I did these early, early drawings of sex in the studio in here, in this area. And I was just interested in the energy that the sex had in that place. And now what happens is that, for instance, uh, I'm now taking pictures of, 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 of cyber sex, real sex, cartoon sex, cyber death, cartoon death, real death, all in this kind of this other world because of the visceral element that when you see a picture of something where it becomes real, it turns you on, you get excited or you get terrified or you get sick, physically sick. If I could come up with a picture that would make you sick, uh, I'm really interested in the chemicals because it's like taking a drug. Looking at a picture is like taking a drug. Going to the movies is like taking a drug. Going, and I work with hypnosis um, to represent that, abstracted, this kind of going in. I remember in this area, about here, I was, um, I was waiting for a bus, going down on the Lexington Avenue a bus, going downtown, and there were a bunch of us waiting. It was a, there was a late bus, and there was a woman that was waiting for the bus as well, and, and she was walking, and I could tell by the way she was walking that she was following someone that was in front of her that I did not see, because our postures, we can identify our po people's postures very directly. Um, she wasn't talking to anyone, it was just that she was leaning towards, there was someone you could tell she wasn't alone. So I, got, I followed her onto the bus and sat directly behind her to see what would happen. And sure enough, within three blocks, she starts talking to this invisible person next to her. And that would be in this area, you know, about here. That's in this area that she was uh, happening. So the brain is way up here, and this is down here. Um, I was doing performances, more performances of going into um, uh, pictures. I was doing performances where I was acting out uh, details from the cosmology in front of an audience, like death pulling the soul out of a dead man, a demon and angel fighting over a dead man's soul. And I had audience members act it out in front of the audience. In 1977, I, in 1973, I wrote a, book, a, a text 
called um, The Details from an Imaginary Life. And it was all these details, one after the other. And um, it's online now um, at the Museum of Modern Art. I just did a performance where I was reading it. So um, it's called Seven Times Seven, and you can look at it and hear this text. But what I did was I hired a hypnotist and three actors to act out details, not all of them. I could have about 30 details from this list in front of an audience in a trance state. And uh, so this dichotomy between the reality and what, they, and what was feeling and I had just run into a friend of mine who I hadn't seen in 15 years. And the first thing she tells me is that she remembers that performance and how freaked out she got when the death scene uh, of this young, of the woman at the end of the performance was terrifying her. Very scary stuff because there was a dead, there was a dying woman in the room. There was. And uh, the woman who played the dying woman believed it, totally believed it, was living it in front of the, uh, of the audience. I got into real trouble uh, with a lot of the audience because they felt that I was manipulating the actors into believing that they were going through all this trauma. And it really wasn't about that at all. It was a matter of demonstrating life. So then I have... Um, so this was, in a way, what I was doing in the, um, in the 70s. Um, towards the end, I had my cosmology, I had this, this, the sequence, all my exhibitions at this time, um, and I just had a few, uh, but in schools mostly, uh, followed this. So you, I would have video here, I would have photographs here, drawings here, and it would go around the room following this chain. So everything here would be like this. So it would go around in a circle. Um, and so those were my exhibitions. Um, and at one point I said, look, I have a cosmology. I've got a language, a media. I have a world. And uh, I can represent that world. I, this is all done on paper at one point. Um, and the paper is, so I said, well, what about representing these things? Not, and, and so I had, I designed posters that would say Mullican world or Mullican hell or he Mullican heaven or Mullican God. And then I would have uh, flags. I made flags that represented these things. So I went to a graphics annual and went to the table of contents and got all that material to make stuff. And what had happened in 76, 77, 78 is that the shadow of Papa Art ceased to be evident. This is really important what happens is that Warhol's shadow, Oldenburg's shadow, Papa Art's shadow, it became that you could start to make that kind of work again. Now I was going to make packaging design and you could say well that's like the Brillo box from Warhol my packaging was representing this. It was a very different thing. Um, and so I had all of these, so what I did, I also, and like Jeff Koons' very early work was at the same time. Uh, Richard Prince's very early work was at the same time. So you had this beginnings of a new thing happening there. Um, at the point in, 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 with this, with the, um, this, the, these, I went through a, uh, the phone book, a flag shop, and they sold, they made buttons, they made patches, they made ribbons, they made pennants, they made banners, they made flags, they made uniforms, they made even, you know, like a metal, uh, medals. And I said, God, I can make all of that stuff. And so then I made, posters, etc. Just everything that could represent this, because I had a cosmology, I had a world view, and that would represent it. My first show in a commercial gallery was in 1980 with Mary Moon, September 1980, and I had, five, I had uh, 10 posters, I had like 15 banners, and I had, um, I had charts, 
I had a bulletin board, which I'll talk about later. I had uh, line drawings, what I called illustrations. I told this to Mary. I want to title them illustrations since we can't title them illustrations. They have to be drawings. They cannot, I can't, you can't use that word to describe these things because I was always fucking up with, the, uh, with how these things are identified and playing with it because that, to a large extent, is what we do in order to kind of refigure things out. We relabel things. That's an important point. <laughs> So now we're going to shift from this world um, into uh, the next, which is going to be with this. So let's, let's do the lighting, and we can go into pictures of what I've done. Do I have a thing I can press to keep it going straight? Yeah, there we go. Up and down. Okay, so here you have, this is my stuff being, um, these are all my drawings of, of, of these interiors. These are my stick figures. Here's a sole, which is a piece of a, piece of a very thin white cloth. This is the, 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 the cloak of demon, of, of the, of the uh, death. Uh, here's the color aid cards. Uh, here's photography, all here. And here are my written pieces, all my written pieces, so all my catalog. And then on the very top, you have my bills, you have my pimple cream and my deodorant. This is the real world on top. So the real world is on top, and then all this other stuff. And these are all separate. This is a, a piece of foam that is tied to make a figure. So one is always aware of this, this combination, like with the cadaver. It's a him or a it. Um, this, this back and forth. So let's see how we do here. Okay, no? Ah, there we go. So here is uh, color under regular lighting and color under green light. Well, it's no big difference, but um, there is a difference. This is the first drawing uh, I did. It was 73. I even dated it. April 12th, 1973. I have it 3 o'clock, and that's just because the most iconic time that I could come up with was when school finished, so I put 3 there. And he says, I said, I got a good piece. And there's a picture on the wall at a table, and he's sitting on the floor. It was really like when I got this, it was the light bulb of my career, of my life, to get this idea. It really changed everything. Um... He has a calendar, uh, a clock, a plant, video corner to see what he does. He would do experiments in this 3D space. Living area. Hey, there you go. Living area. There's a bed. So again, the architect, I have a plan. The first drawing was a plan like an architect makes. A, a design for a place. Because it makes it more real. It is reality. That's not saying it is reality, because it's not. It just represents it. The difference between representation and presentation. This is such a big deal uh, in, within my generation. I think it continues to be one. There's, uh, Glenn notices a note that's been slipped under his studio door. So there was no, f this is the, these are the first drawings, so there's no frame. Glenn thinks about the time he heard himself skiing. The sound from next door drives Glenn crazy. Glenn falls asleep near the corner of his studio. Here's a drawing, a uh, fictional landscape, detail. So this picture, you can't read it, but this drawing is taken inside the picture. So I went into the picture and looked at the back and drew the back of the house. Now the, I, the thing was, is that this is virtual. Because what I'm attempting to get to is a feeling of being inside the picture. Not that I'm in the picture, but the feeling is evoked of being inside. And to say that that's a real place. This, of, this evoking of this feeling is at the beginning of virtual space. And, and when you talk about trompe l'oeil painting going back 2,000 years, that's still the feeling that they're after. I think the difference between trompe l'oeil and this kind of 3D uh, uh, submersion 
It's very, it's very cool, very important. So this is like, this picture was inside there. That's a detail of Death's cape. So Death is off camera. So Death is up here somewhere. Now with Death, what I did was, well, let's see. That's the soul being stretched between a demon and an angel. And the soul, um, and again, these are from drawings. I think that's from a Durer. The detail on the left is from a Durer. And I did this as a performance with two, act, two volunteers from an audience. So that's um, Death's Cape and Life's Cape, I think. And, um, or Fate's Cape and Death's Cape, one of the two. And the thing is that what I did with this, and it's hanging on the wall, what I did with this was I did everything that, say, someone like Richard Serra does to material, I did with these metaphorical images, with these algor uh, allegorical images. So not only am I stepping on what they're doing, it, I'm poisoning it. By, so I have death's cape on fire in a room, or I'm stretching it from, from edge to edge, or I'm tearing it up into pieces and throwing it on the floor like a very levee. So I'm taking the allegory and I'm messing with it the way Richard Serra would have messed with lead or with, with, with any material. So, or, or any number of artists, 20 artists that were doing it at the time. And, I was, and what I'm saying is that it, it is not about, nothing is based in physicality. It all has to go back to the brain. It all has to go back to the experience, which is filtered through our minds. Um, like someone like, um, you know, ta reading about painting. I'm still curious about what painters do because mm -hmm. I still don't understand it. But when you're painting something, it's a mental state that you're representing. It's not a physical state. Thinking of the time you heard himself skiing. Uh, details from an imaginary universe. So these are just small details. And then these are dead cartoon characters, which I collected. Valerie, good Lord. He's dead, and poor Tom is only holding on by a thread. And she says, Elaine, Elaine. And um, the doctor um, came, and, but the guy was dead. And so I collected about eight dead cartoon characters, and I was just interested in the life that they had led. This is the old cosmology, where you have, there I am before I am born, there's fate, there's death, and, and going up to heaven. Now, to, just to be clear about this, see, when you go down to hell or up to heaven, it's very much, you see you have it here, this Y-shaped. This is interesting. You have it this. So the line, and then you go up or down. And then here, the same thing happens. You go up or you go down. So my heaven is not good and my hell is not bad. My heaven is subject and my hell is object. You could say that, that, that and, and that, when we die, we don't go, and when I, and the new cosmology, when I die, I don't go to one or the other, I go to both. And I'm redefined in both. So this is from the 70s, this is from the 80s. This is a rubbing of a plate that I made in stone because my interest that occurred in the late 70s with packaging design and flags and buttons and pennants and all that, later on, became rubbings because, and paintings, and, and stone, and etched, I worked in etched glass, stained glass, blown glass, ceramics, um, all the crafty arts, wood carving. Um, and so here, um, this is a rubbing, which is the first form of reproducible media. It's several thousand years old, and it represents this cosmology where their fate has now been turned, where you have the face of life and the face of death. He no longer has a, he has a line in between. That's life, that's death, that's hell, that's the demon and the angel. And when you're born, you go this way, 
and the demon pulls you down to hell and the angel up to God, and then you're reborn before, and then you come back again. So that's the, the, the movement that occurs. This is the same chart from uh, 75. That's me going into the, um, into the uh, entrance to hell uh, in 76, and I'm describing the performance of this place to this audience. That's me going into the Paranese print in 73. Um, I was invited with some friends to go to, could we turn down these lights? Yeah. Oh, oh boy, this is a problem, right? Two, ar two, 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 two architectures <laughs> represented by one window. Um, so I was invited to, um, to an exhibition in Hall Walls. And this is how things happened back then. Uh, uh, I, friends of mine, David Sally, um, Jack Goldstein, you may not know these names, but they've since become fairly f famous in the art world. We were invited up to Hall Walls, and that was a situation where a bunch of artists lived up there, and they created a gallery space, and they invited artists from New York up there. They got money together, and so they would put up shows, and then they could pick the brain of the people from New York. And that was Robert Longo and Cindy Sherman, Michael Zwack, um, Charlie Clough. They all created this place. And this was the show that I did up there. Douglas Crimp uh, likened my, my installation to a dormitory room. And I liked that idea that what I was doing was somehow, because when you go off to school, you bring your life with you. So I had all these photographs that I was saying I was taking of. Like that's the inside of a stove. There's a light socket. There's a, there's a TV and so forth. Uh, film stills. Um, then you have the cadaver and then the dead man. Here's pinching the cadaver's arm. And I wanted to put them up, but I didn't want to put them up in a grid. I wanted to put them up the way they would be posted in a studio wall. Just put up in order to, like, like a bulletin board, I wanted to put up the pictures. And this was the first one that I did. And um, it since had turned into a thing onto its own. Uh, and then next to it you have all the dirt. There's death and the angel's wing and all this weirdo crappy stuff having to do with the cosmology. So this is all mental, supremely mental. And this is all physical. Where you have the full cadaver uh, from head to toe. And then it moved from there to signs. Uh, signs, and then I had patches, I had jewelry, I had flags, and I even had um, a t-shirt. The man broken up, you see what you have here is that I was always told that under every object there was a word. Uh, when I was in elementary school, I remember the teacher saying that under every object there was a word. Um, and, I, and I didn't believe her. And so here, this, where you put all these pieces together, it creates that, and then that becomes the definition of each of these. So that is, you can see what that is from here. You can see what that is through here. So together, they create meaning, separate their abstract. So there's this back and forth. So you see there up there, there's the, the soul being stretched between a demon and an angel, which is simply a, a, a piece of cloth. There is heaven, sky, ground, and hell, which is medieval, and um, it goes way back. And, but that's, in a way, the beginning of my five worlds. Um, and then I had somewhere, there's a man in the middle between heaven and hell. The hell obviously being object, and the heaven being my heaven is, is, is mental, and my hell is object. So this is the beginning of the chart that, that, that is in my work. And then, rather than say what it was, I had a sign and a book, and the sign in the book with an actual drawing of what that means. So there was never, I never used words if I could help it. That's a, the death pulling the soul out of a dead man, and I'm playing the dead man at the kitchen. I, I purchased a skeleton, 
and I unpacked it at the kitchen. Uh, Center of Performing Arts in Soho in the, in the late 70s. And you could buy a body at that point. You can no longer buy a body. You, and you cannot even trans, you can't even ship a body. Um, and yet I could at that point buy a body. And the two exporters of bodies were India and Mexico. They were the big exporters. And so I was unpacking it. There's the packaging. And, and just laying it out there in front of an audience. And I didn't want to put it together as uh, articulated. I wanted it disarticulated. I wanted it to be a field of parts. The dead man and the doll's head. Pinching the dead man's arm. Probably the most important, uh, for me, the most important uh, photo of that whole experience. You could see the, the body and how it's looking at that point. It was in formaldehyde for six months. So they said to the students that it was a model of a body. It was not a real body anymore because every cell had been transformed through the process of the embalmment, uh, through, 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 the, through the material. So it was no longer a body. Well, you can say anything you want, but uh, it's true. It, it was still a body. Hand in the mouth, hand in the gut. And then I had my aunt, Aunt Mahoda in Chickasha, Oklahoma, do to herself what I did to the cadaver and what Glenn did to himself. And here she is pinching her own arm in her living room. This is a headache. This is done uh, via uh, a plasticine. And um, it lasted as long as I took the photo and then it disappeared. It only existed for the photograph. Uh, the, I made stuffed, and I stuffed figures that I slept with. I made a body, a head and body, and a person. This is a sign that I put in hall walls that I bought in a stationary store. This is a head and body, um, the most, uh, which is just a, a newspaper folded. And the back, that's what I said what it was. I said it was a person. There's a two head and bodies. And then the man with the sky and ground. Again, this is the breaking up. The bulletin board. So the boards themselves grew. And um, this is the MIT project. So this is all comic books here. These are drawings. See, there's Death's Cape stretched uh, like, a, like, like, in a, like a Richard Serra. And then here you have photographs from a scrapbook. So I'm, in a way, curating. The thing about the bulletin boards is that they make everything that is impersonal, personal. And they make everything that's personal, impersonal. Uh, so I can put photographs of my parents, and they would be no different from a postcard that I bought the same day uh, as posting it. They would all be equalized. They all become material. So here's just a bunch of different uh, bulletin boards. Here, and I, and I set them up. Um, they hold each other up. Here is um, a flag from 1982. I was in India, and I, and I came up. This is a, the beginnings of a chart. Does someone have some keys they can give me? I'll do a demonstration of what the five worlds mean. Since I hate keys, and I, and I put them away. There we go. Okay. So this is material. This is the world. This is the world framed. This is language. And that's subject. And so we'll start with the world elements. And so these keys, pretend there's a giant, giant uh, uh, frying pan, an atomic frying pan, the hottest place on the planet. They spent billions of dollars making this. And we, have to, and we can see it, but we have to see through uh, glass, which is you know, two meters thick. And I throw, and it's so hot that I throw the keys over the wall of glass, and as they are flying over, the, the, the heat twists the metal. At one very important point, the keys no longer function. They twist, they move, they become, they're no longer keys, they're no longer working keys. They are still, represent keys, but they're no longer. It hits 
the, it hits the ground, it hits the pan itself, and immediately it starts to melt. The soft metal starts to dissolve. Within a minute, the hard metal starts, and you just have different metals coexisting. And then that lasts about two minutes, and it becomes dust, and it disappears. And so that's material without meaning. That absence of meaning is very important down here. Um, the next is the world unframed. And that's the everyday life. That is these keys 10 minutes ago before I got them on stage. So these keys as they existed or how your own keys exist now 10 minutes ago. Um, the next is taking the keys out of here and putting them in here. And um, here is they're becoming, um, they're becoming on their way to becoming mental. They are framed. Um, they're on display. We've taken them out of our pocket and we're looking at them. We are looking at them for what they represent. They're not simply being used. And that's here. I can say that these were Elvis Presley's keys. I can say that. And so these were Elvis Presley's keys. And they were found by, the, by, by one of the, um, the people that worked at Graceland, found them. And, um, and Graceland uh, was very much interested in it, but the person who found them ha owned them for some bizarre reason. Elvis might have given it to them or whatever. In any case, they're being put up at auction and they are expected. Now, every, and Elvis, what he did was that he would lock and unlock all the doors of Graceland every day. Because he was, a, he was a, a bit crazy that way, but he really, the only thing he did as a routine was to lock the doors at night. And so he held these keys, it was very important. And they're being put at auction. All the locks have been changed, so they're no longer working keys. It's incidental what they do. They've now become symbolic, and they're expected to bring in $80,000, these keys. That's how much they're expecting. And the auction goes, and they actually went for $120,000, and uh, Graceland bought them back. They brought, bought them. They're doing a show, and the show with the photographs of the keys, and that's up in this area. So the keys are now emblematic, they are in a case, they are, they are language, they are no longer used, they're no longer in the real world, they are in this other place. The emphasis is not on them working, the emphasis is on what they are. So that's where up here. So there are posters, there's an ad campaign, there's radio spots, that's all in this area. And then you go to the top, which is the subjective. And the reason that I don't have keys on me is that I personally hate keys. I hate the iPhone when I turn it on that I have to go with that fucking code. I, I really don't like the, key, the keys. A friend of mine, had Robert Longo, had a car and he never locked it. Not only did he not lock it, he, he locked it, he didn't lock it with the windows open. So no one could, because too many people had broken into his car. So he said, okay, I'm not having anything. I'm opening the windows. It's a crappy car. And I, and I like this. I commended. I was, I was mugged trying to get into my house in New York City because I was looking for my keys to unlock the door. So this is, this is something I really don't like the idea of keys personally. So that would be up here. My hatred of keys up here which apply to all keys. Then the physicality of the keys here. So that is meaning without material and material without meaning. This is how you can say all my charts are based in that. Here we go. Now we're gonna go quickly. We're gonna storm ahead. How much time do we have? 20 minutes. Okay, we're gonna go really quick. So there's another chart. These are the charts. Um, they're almost outsider kind of cosmology looking things where you have the fate above and demon and angel and all this stuff. Um, the charts themselves um, are all top and bottom, but what if I did them in glass? So there's no top or bottom, left or right. So then it's not hierarchical anymore, it's simply a relationship. So it's a big difference between the flat one like that and this in a round. These are on blown glass, it's not plastic. And then to flatten them out, I made photograms of them. 
This is my first show at Mary Boone, where you have a bulletin board, flags, posters, charts, signs, and head and body. People thought it was a group show. They didn't know it was one person's show. They, they thought this was an artist who did the signs, and that the other person was an artist who did the other stuff. Two person show. Um, back in the day, people thought that my work had to do with Egypt and with pictograms and relationship. This is before computers. This is before interface design. Uh, so you have the head and the sign above this image of culture. And what it is is that this is the two big subjects. So this is like ways of looking at the different signs. And then the different colors are, of course, pertaining to that chart I showed earlier. Um, I had someone come up to me at a party and said, you know, I just thought about your work. I bought a, a, a TV. I didn't understand what you did in the 80s, but I got a TV. I plugged it in, I turned it on, and there was your work all over it. The, all the signs were right there. And then I understood what you were doing back 20 years ago or 25 years ago. People didn't, I didn't even understand what I was doing, but this was designed as an interface, a very simple interface. And um, before we had personal computers. No one had personal computers at this point. This is before that. Moloch in heaven, before birth, God, demon and angel. God, death, before birth, heaven. So the subject is very weird, but old. You know, life, fate, God, demon and angel, hell, death, before birth and heaven. A Mulligan generator. This is like the cosmology as I showed it to you. This is the city plan, and so I have these five worlds, and I applied it to architecture. So here you have, um, this is the wall of history, this is subject, this is language, this is the arts, this is the world unframed, and this is the elements. Then I have these banners, this is the Bagazan, not far from here. And so this is a 90, one, 90, 91, and where the signs are becoming physical. So here you are, these banners, you can put one banner into a briefcase. And uh, they, they are becoming a kind of architecture. This is at Alexander train uh, station in Berlin. This is in 94. The flags are from 85, 84. That's the cosmology. And no one talked about the fact that they're red, black, and white, and they're on circles, black on circles. The, no one mentioned this. I said, they look very Japanese, don't they? <laughs> and also, no one knows what that's fate. I know that's fate, but the language is totally personal, but it's a personal language representing a cosmology that I invented in order to live in this world. Not in order to live, but to reflect the idea of inventing a cosmology not to be a cosmology to actually function. Because a cosmology is a social phenomenon, not a formal one. This is at the, um, this is at the uh, National Gallery. And I learned to work with an architect here because I had initially wanted to have the flags going this direction on the inside to create rooms. And the, uh, and the building said no. Everything had to face, the corners could be, I could have corners, but everything had to be frontal. The building absolutely was brilliant, and um, it stayed up for, a, it was at the same time as they wrapped the Reichstag, as Christo did, and so different institutions were doing projects like this. Um, I was asked to do a project, I mean, I got a phone call when I, in LA, I did an exhibition at a gallery, Richard Kulenschmidt Gallery, and the phone call, the guy called me, said, would you like to walk into your own city? And I said, absolutely, you know, because I had talked, I had walked into my drawings with my mind's eye, but what would happen if I walked in uh, without that? And so they said, I represent a company called Video, uh, 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 digital productions, and they did all the virtual kind of uh, logoing for major networks in the U.S. They did this film, the first digital formatted movie, sci-fi movie, where they didn't use physical 
um, phys phys visual effects, but they used digital visual effects, was called The Last Starfighter. And they produced that. They, they did all the work on that. So I had this done. So the five worlds are existing in the virtual. This was done with a supercomputer back in the day. This was in 86. 86. And then in 89, um, a million and a half polygons. Um, this is all uh, different sheets. It's about 20 feet wide. And um, so the, 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 here's the city plan. This is elements. This is the regular life. That's the world frame. That's the subjective. The, the world broken up. The world reproduced. This is an exact reproduction of the whole and then broken up again into parts. And then the subjective is always empty. I never have anything in there. Um, but uh, the reviews were terrible. I got the worst review of my life for this show. Um, the guy concentrated on the fact that you have these buildings and it looked like Cabousier's Paris. And so he was so pissed off that I would represent Cabousier as a representation of architecture. I mean, this is crazy. I mean, why not? I mean, the guys, I mean, if you're going to represent anybody, you might as well represent, well, amongst others, him. It's like, so, but I did that. And he never in the review mentioned that the entire thing was virtual and that the whole thing was an allegory of those five worlds. The whole thing, it's, a, it, it's, it's not, I'm not an architect. And yet, I fooled them. They thought, he thought I was somehow. Um, and, that, and, and, and that's a kind of a curious thing. So there's a detail. All the windows in this part are in the same shape as this, which is the shape of the elements. This is a cemetery, a hospital, a prison, and a homeless shelter. So this is the neighborhood having to do with, obviously, with the physical al physicality. Um, this is um, later... This is a French Ministry of Culture did a project with, which was virtual, um, where you could enter uh, this place with the headphones and walk around it. This is a fly, I'm flying in it, but you one could go on the ground and walk down these streets. This was 91, and this was a virtual environment, and I did not want to make it fancy. I did not want texture mapping. I did not want it to look like the real world. I wanted it to look like language. Thus, it has this very simplistic uh, viewing and uh, very cliched. I mean, you have a big yellow frame and then the two signs in front of it and then these little, they look like Monopoly game things. Very, very, uh, very simple. This is um, uh, the subjective. This is the, sh the show. So I had all these light boxes. This is at Porticus, a plotter drawing. Um, I had this, this same print that you saw earlier, and I had video of going into this world. And then these are two, um, what they were called lasography. These are details from the virtual. Five worlds represented in five different parts. So if you're in, in this part, in the green area, that's what you see. When you go to the blue area, you see this. When you go to the yellow area, you see this. When you go to the black area, you see this. And when you go to the red area, it's not there. But um, the point is, is that there are five holes and that this chart becomes an interface. This lines on the floor become a way of defining where you are. It's like changing the channel on a TV. Uh, I made these rocks, and, and I thought, well, and I heard I was in a place called Imogena, which was this kind of high-tech, uh, like, uh, trade fair of sorts. And I said, well, golly, what if I was to make those rocks real? And there was a medium that was just born, I mean, within months. And we made uh, 3D printing of those rocks, and that's what these are cost a ton of money, like $20,000 to produce these rocks back then. Uh, now you can buy it. But this was, gosh, well, how long, about 25 years ago? Something like this, ridiculous. 
So it's probably the first artwork done in that material um, of an international artist. This is um, something later on having to do with atmosphere inside the picture. These are all default atmospheres that I did in the, in the 2000s. These are animations, the dying stick figure, cosmology. These are all computer animations. Oh, what did I do? Uh, the MIT, where you have the five worlds, there's skeleton, and then you have the signs from uh, the world, um, um, framed and unframed. This is a documenta. See, from above, because you could enter the room, you saw this. So it's like a big logo. And then in the room, I had bulletin boards. And then on the bulletin board, you had pictures. And in the pictures, you'd have images. So the generation is that you have an image. Then you have a board. Then, so that's one. The board, the board is two. The room is three. And then the whole thing is four. So it is an architecture that represents the decoding or encoding of information. This is at 92. So this is something, I don't know, a while ago. And then when you go in, it becomes abstract. When you're above, you can see it. But when you go in, it's abstract. And then I applied that to architecture. And this is a gallery show that I had in New York at Barbara Gladstone. And this is a show I had at... Uh, at the, at, the, at the Haus der Kunst, with the flags above, and then the MIT inside model. Uh, this is a, a, a carpet at the Hirshhorn. This is a rubbing, a big rubbing, again, uh, dealing with the, the, the city plan. And then the, and up, that same system applied to an anatomy and to a figure. So the a, a system applied to the landscape and the system of, applied to the self. This is the rubbing again, the cosmology. So being, and, and it would take, it take, it maybe takes a day or two to cut out the relief. This is a relief I made on board. And then it takes less than, say, 10 minutes to do the rubbing, the actual rubbing. This is uh, generators and the cosmology. This is a, a, uh, a theater that in the back of the theater you'd have all of your sets. The sets are then in a museum with, with, the, with, with, with all the text around them, and then the texts go on to the library. So it goes from a theater to a museum to a library, which is not unlike this this chart. More rubbings. Stained glass. I worked in stained glass. And this is a model um, with these roads and walls. Very game-like um, because it's a closed system that can actually go on infinitely. Uh, I can go on forever uh, dealing with permutations. This is a concrete uh, piece, um, weighs 150 tons, this, this sculpture. And then that's, a, a, that's with gypsum board, that's the MIT. This is the Kroller Mueller Museum. And a map is essentially a weightless phenomenon, especially on your phone. It has no mass. It simply is a change of material. And yet I decided to make a map out of concrete. So it was the opposite of what it is, in a way. And people could walk on this. Kids and people loved, I mean, it was fun to walk on. Because they needed to have all these pillars underneath in the basement to prop it up. Otherwise, it'd fall through the floor. It was so heavy. This is outside in Graz. This is perma No, this is in, um, not Graz. This is in, uh, it's in Switzerland. Zug. This is in Zug where you have this chart that I described, a small chart with the signs, and then uh, a signs on, on this table. A plaque in, in Bath, England. I did this, if you ever go to the Unisphere, which at one point was considered to be the world's largest sculpture, and um, I did these etched stone pieces uh, having to do with the history of the two world's fair sites. This is another stone piece that I did in North Carolina. This is bath stone, made with the same materials. 
This is me um, at the age of 26 uh, in a hypnotic trance, um, believing that I was something like uh, seven years old, eight, uh, five, six or seven. That's me in a trance state uh, performing, pulling up my leg and hiding behind my book. This is at the, uh, at the Tate Modern. A terrible experience. So what happened was that I had been doing performances with hypnosis. And I noticed that whenever I did these performances that I would become a, a, a weirdo. I became a strange person. Um, and Caspar Koenig had worked and rather than, it was a very important curator who did the Munster Sculpture Project amongst many, many other things. He had seen this performance and it made him extremely nervous because when he saw me performing, he saw that I was acting as if I was psychotic. Um, and as a psychotic, it, and he could see it so clearly, it made him extremely nervous. And he was pacing in the back. I remember him pacing. I didn't know who it was, but someone was pacing in the background. So then I was invited to do an exhibition at the, at the Ludwig Museum, and, and he wanted me to do something else. And I said, what if I get the psychotic, that person, to make all the art? And he loved the idea. So then I made the pictures. Now, it says, I love to work for truth and beauty. And that's what that person says. Now, I've never used the word love in my work. And I've done a lot of pieces. Never used the word love. Never used the word beauty, ever. Now, these were ter and truth. Who talks about truth? Because love, truth, and work are all so, and beauty are all so subjective. So, but he loves this stuff. And here, this is Baby Love, which is a supreme song. And you can see at the beginning, it's like this. And what happens is that it slowly degenerates into this. Baby Love, my baby love. And the guy loves love. I mean, truly, and loves rock and roll. A hamburger, this is, a, this is from a, a menu that I owned, and I just copied. This is the hamburger charbroils. And this is something else. I can't even read it, but it's there. I have to go. OK, here we go. Bulletin boards, inside the chart, inside the chart. These are all bed sheets with working sheets of paper. Melted telephone. And that's the end of the slide. That's Baldessari's class. We were all doing a field trip behind school making art. And, and the video is available. You have it. Yeah, we can put it on. Maybe not. Yeah, yeah, you put it on as I go. Thank you very much. Okay. told me I should stop doing these things after this. Uh, Christopher Williams was in the audience, and he couldn't look at me in the face after this. He was so upset. So I have to run. Yeah, Is someone going to run with me? Thank you.
Thank you. 